fingers crossed. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, I'm Fabiana Bacchini, the Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. Uh, we are committed to keeping informed and updated with the latest development of the COVID-19 that is relevant for an ICU parent, whether you're home or a student in ICU with your baby. And every Monday and Fridays at 1 p.m., we are hosting Facebook Lives with experts, and you can send us your comments, your questions, your concerns to have them addressed by those experts. And every Wednesday, 1 p.m., also Eastern Time, Katie Robson, who is a psychotherapist and also a mom of two preemie girls, uh, is hosting a real-time peer group for an ICU parents. Uh, for that, you have to join our Canadian Premier Parents Network Facebook group because this group is for parents only. So we also have a 24-7 peer support group on Facebook that you can join us. There's a, a great conversation among parents. We're sharing our experiences, our resources, and what are we feeling during this pandemic that uh, it seems that it's going to be longer than we had expected. And we are bringing all the resources for you on our website, uh, canadianpremies.org. And today I have the pleasure to have Dr. Paige Church here with me. Uh, I'm going to introduce her. She is the director of neonatal follow-up program at the University of Toronto. She's also the medical director of the neonatal follow-up clinic at Sunnybrook Health Science Center and the developmental behavior physician lead in the Spina Bifida Clinic at Holland Blueview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. She's also an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Toronto and is a great doctor. If you had the pleasure to meet Dr. Page, I think all the parents love her and the work that she does. Dr. Page, thank you so much for joining us here today, for taking time away from your family and your patients to really support the families virtually I seem to be our new ward right now. So thank you. Thank you. So I will start by asking a very general question that a lot of parents across the country are asking us, what is happening in terms of neonatal follow-up clinics today? <clears throat> we have the information that the clinics are closed physically, but many of them are still uh, doing remote work. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I think collectively most clinics uh, decided that in-person visits were no longer a safe option after around the middle of March. Um, and we were also in that decision and that was with some public health input. Um, and so many clinics have gone to remote options. Some are using telephones and calling to check in. Um, others are going via video and there's different formats for that. Um, at Sunnybrook, what we have decided to do is we've gone all virtual. So we're doing as many visits as we can by um, video conference. And for those families that either don't have access to that or don't want it, we're also doing phone visits. And we found that it's gone really, really well. I mean, it certainly isn't the same as being in person, but for some families at a distance, uh, it's been a great option. So um, in some ways, I suspect I suspect we will continue this practice for some families even after the pandemic has ended. Okay, so how, what can we do during those virtual sessions and those appointments? Um, I mean, I think while we can't, if we can have video access, it certainly adds an element of being able to see your child. For our older school children, we've actually been doing assessments um, still. Um, the tricky ones are the younger ones and the toddlers because they're not quite as compliant with a video. Um, but certainly babies, we can see a lot about how the baby's moving, what their development looks like. Um, so for us, it being able to see makes a huge difference. I think for families, there is still a benefit in the virtual visits because we can talk about feeding, we can talk about behavior, we can talk about concerns you may have, um, resources that may be available. For example, some of our infant development colleagues in Toronto are doing virtual visits. So we're continuing to refer. Um, some therapy groups are doing um, virtual coaching of parents, that, that may be an option. So um, it may be just an opportunity to tap into what's local and what's available and, and guide families um, a little bit more clearly as to what, what we can offer. 
Oh, that is so great because I, I talked to a lot of parents before the pandemic and parents said, you know, my kids go to the clinic and they don't do anything. And I'm going to start to make videos and bring it to the follow-up appointment so they can actually see the child in the, its own environment and at home. Is this a bonus for at this time? How can, I mean, can we look at the glass half full for that? Totally. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was talking to my senior colleague in the clinic uh, yesterday or today, and she said how opposed she had been to doing virtual visits because she thought she could never do what she needed to do. And now she loves them. She thinks that they're the best because we don't deal with a car ride. We don't deal with um, fatigue from the trip, um, car sickness. You know, there's all these variables that come into it, traffic. Um, the children are in their own environment and we get to see the home and 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 have a little bit of a better sense of what life is really like for kids so i like i said i really think we at sunnybrook will be endorsing some version of virtual no matter what happens with the pandemic as we move forward this will become part of our platform of clinic we have loved it that um, is that's wonderful to hear so and i believe hopefully the families are enjoying it as much as we are but I believe for families who live also remotely, it's some um, is a is a good option because you don't have to travel to Toronto yeah. or to the big cities to to have those appointments. Totally. I mean, I think you know, I grew up in Vermont, and I had to commute to Boston for my healthcare for a lot of my specialized healthcare. That's a long trip. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to access resources and not get in the car. Okay, but my, my question now is, if you were to give a, a new diagnosis or or new diagnoses are possible to be done virtually. Because I think that is a very uh, difficult time for families. I mean, even in person, how do you break news for families when they don't want to hear those news? Uh, and what is the situation when it comes to diagnosis? So um, certainly, you know, having conversations that are trap challenging, conversations that might, uh, um, uh, be, you know, upsetting or frightening for families. I do, I worry about this medium. Um, but the flip side of it is that the way I've practiced and the way I think we should all practice is being honest, um, consistently. So no diagnosis should come out of left field. We should be talking about what we're seeing at every single visit. And, and I'm going to say also, I believe very firmly in this. I grew up with children who had cerebral palsy as my colleagues and my patient friends in the hospital. I watched them move mountains and do incredible things. So to me, it's really about describing an alternative way of, of living, not necessarily a less successful or a um, negative thing. So I think having honest conversations, couching that children who have disabilities, while it is significant, and I'm not diminishing that at all, um, they also are capable of tremendous magic and what they need is alternative resources to get there. So opening the door to starting to talk about that should be an ongoing conversation. And the diagnosis should really be the, the you know, a conversation that goes on, but not one that just starts and not one that ends with that diagnosis. Um, how we're going to do it online, we have done some at Sunnybrook. Um, and we've talked about it and we've reviewed, did we think it was um, done as well as we could? Um, and I think right now, the answer is right now we're doing our best and I hope it's effective. Um, and we'll have to get feedback from those families. It is harder because you're not able to touch the child and feel the tone. So some of the diagnoses we're making today were diagnoses we've been talking about in January and February. So we had touched the children. If this pandemic is to continue and I'm seeing a child that I've never touched, I think it's going to be a little bit more challenging because um, having your hands and doing a physical exam is a key component of it. Although early on, there's more and more evidence that watching with our eyes and seeing how babies move tells us a lot about how their brain is functioning. And um, so that combined with neonatal course, combined with imaging, maybe, I'm not going to say it's my first choice, but if this pandemic continues, it may be the best thing we have to offer and not doing a formal physical. Right. Okay. Paige, but your uh, perception and uh, the way you approach disability is very different than a lot of other physicians because you have your own experience that you share so openly. And for me, as a mother of a child who has cerebral palsy, I really always appreciate the way you talk about it and the possibilities for those children, uh, which is my own experience. When I remember when I left my own follow-up appointment with the diagnosis of cerebral palsy, 
And I felt that the world had collapsed. So I say, where do I move from now? Where do I go now? Until I found my new peer support group and new therapies and what could I could do for my son. But at this time, if you make that diagnosis, that is really life-changing for that family. And we know all the therapies and all the, the centers are closed. Yes. What can those families do? Where, where they can go for, for help, for support, or to move on with that child's development? Because six months for a, a baby's life, it's a lifetime. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think what we have been doing and what I would recommend is most of the treatment centers are closed. They're not taking new patients, but I still believe strongly in getting in line. Um, because even if I made a diagnosis in Toronto on a normal day where we weren't in the middle of pandemic, I'd still have to get in line to see my colleagues at Blue Review that do cerebral palsy. Um, so I believe that the timeliness still exists. And then, um, you know, I'm hopeful that with more and more clinics getting online, that some of the coaching um, around exercises and stretches that can be done can be taught to the families and can be coached, you know, through virtual. Um, we've we haven't gotten to the point of doing coaching around cerebral palsy, but we've put up several videos for families just on coaching around motor transitions and how to help establish them. Um, and I think that that's a great first step. I think becoming educated um, about the diagnosis, learning about all the incredible human beings that exist with this diagnosis and the things they've done and reframing your expectations. I still anticipate that these children have opportunities, opportunities for an advanced education, opportunities for jobs, opportunities for, you know, my ultimate goal and the one that if I can really like slam dunk, it, it's been done well, that they have an opportunity for an intimate relationship that is fulfilling as they become an adult, not until they're like, whatever, 30 or 40, but <laughs> you know, that is where I've struck gold. And there are many human beings who have significant physical disabilities that are married, that are sexually active, that have incredible lives. And that's, that's what we all want, you know, how you get there, you know, we'll do it. Absolutely. I, I, could talk to be you. I, could, I could talk to you about this forever because I love the, your, your, the way you see it. And it's so beautiful. And obviously for me, because my son has quadriplegia cerebral palsy, I love when you see the future, what, what is possible for those children. And the diagnosis do not define who they are. It's just what they have. That's not who they are. And that's, something that we all learn as a parent of kids with special needs. And I honestly think the diagnoses usually make the kids more kick-ass. Uh, <laughs> I think it, it makes a family more, more. I mean, and I know that's a total bias, but siblings of children with disabilities often go on to do incredible things because they've been changed and shaped in a way that's very positive. Children with disabilities go on, have the potential to do amazing things. One of my colleagues in Boston was a speech language pathologist who had cerebral palsy. And she and I would crack up over some of the things and she's brilliant and she has children and she has a life and she gets aches and she gets tight and we talk about it and we laugh and everybody is going to struggle with the same things as we get older, mobility, discomfort, uh, incontinence, like you name it, it's coming down the pipeline as we get older. So our children get a little taste of it sooner, but there's so much out there for them that can normalize it and make it so that it's just something that they deal with, but not who defines them. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. So, but Paige, a lot of families also ask us about, uh, you know, they noted some developmental delays that not necessarily going to lead to a diagnosis, but we know our preemie babies, if they're born so early, they are going to be late with their development or sitting or crawling. If a parent is noticing something at home, what can they do now? Besides, I know you just offered the videos. Is there anything else they should be doing when they should be concerned and look for help from their healthcare provider? Well, I think the first thing, and this is common knowledge, but I think sometimes we lose sight of it, is that children catch up in their own way. And uh, the smaller, the more prem they are, the more, um, sometimes the more, the harder it is to predict exactly what they're gonna do with their catch up. But the general trend is that the smaller, the more immature, the longer the catch up's gonna take. Um, and so in the middle of this, it's gonna be frustrating. There's gonna be moments where you, you might get really stressed, but I would go back to looking at what your baby's accomplished and, and where they are and what they're doing and sort of celebrate that. Um, you know, we saw a little girl um, and she's not, she's, she's not delayed for any significant reason. 
she's a little motor delayed and part of its opportunity. She's sort of a, a bigger baby. Um, and so we were talking about putting her in a hamper and helping her learn how to sit by sitting in a hamper because it's kind of safe, you know? You know what a hamper is, those plastic baskets? Um, Cause she can sort of wobble around in there and it's, it's fairly safe or even smaller, like a Tupperware bin. Um, there are great ways to just help our kids start to work on their muscles and, and exercise them. Old fashioned things like putting them back on their tummies. Um, we don't need a lot of toys to establish a lot of motor development. Um, that's a great way to encourage um, basic motor development. If you don't have a bumbo seat, we're using kind of plastic bins, stick them in that. Um, you know, we can be creative. Supervision, keep them on the floor so they don't fall anywhere um, and just keep, keep enjoying them. And with the enjoyment, they will develop. There is no way a child will, develop, will not develop with that kind of input from a mom or a dad or a parent. It's awesome. huge. So how about behavior uh, mm. issues? Because now, uh, obviously, it's an extra layer of <laughs> behavior issues that I guess we're all experiencing by being home, not being able to go out or to socialize with friends. Obviously, for children who already were prone to have some behavior issues, and now you added this new element. What yeah. can parents do? Uh, what should they be watching for? So I don't know if you can see this. I see if I can put it up there and it'll come up. Nope, it won't show. Uh, anyway, it's a great New Yorker cartoon and it has these two parents sitting at the table in the living room, like relaxing with a cup of tea. And then there's like a doorway and their kid is flying by the doorway. And it says, she was Zen five minutes ago. Uh, and I sent it to my kids' teachers because <laughs> we've been dealing with that too. It is very common our children are going to have behavioral challenges right now. We're having them. Think about how we're all dealing with this as adults. Like we're struggling with our anxiety. We're struggling with feeling cooped up. We're struggling with, um, you know, feeling the pressure of worrying about financial stuff. I mean, there's lots in our heads um, and it's affecting how we interact. You can only imagine them with children. Their routine has been disrupted. They're not getting out. They're not getting the same exercise. It's, they're bound to have behavior problems. So. What I would say is the fundamental things are bookends. So have your day start and end uh, in a fairly regular and regimented way. Um, so try to maintain a normal wake up time, uh, a normal breakfast routine and a normal dinner and a normal bedtime routine. If you can just establish those things, and this is tricky, you know, I'm working full time. My husband's been working full time. Um, so for us, that's really not very easy, but we've been really, I've been trying very hard at sort of establishing that and then, you know, if you can establish a routine, and I would try to encourage that routine has a huge amount of physical exercise. Um, children need it in order not to get squirrely. Um, so while parks are closed, you can still go for walks. You can, like one of my neighbors, I thought this was brilliant. Um, she put mittens on her kids and she let them, she turned picking up garbage off of the, the grass uh, into a Easter egg hunt and could they find it? And so these kids were scouring the yards looking for garbage and picking it up and they're like, oh, I found some and they're holding up a Starbucks cup. And, um, you know, that's a great way to get some exercise out, take them out for bike rides. Um, those are going to be key things and then trying to establish a routine. So maybe it's quiet academic work from nine to depending on their age, you know, half an hour if they're really young to an hour if they're older. And then there's a wiggle break and it might be that they do, they go on zoom or google and they look up a yoga class or a exercise class and then they sit back down and they do academic work or if it's a younger child they do another activity one of the greatest things i saw on instagram was contact paper sticky paper although i think you could do it even with saran wrap and you put it on the wall with paint tape and then the you paint she painted a fishbowl and she let the child put you know she cut out little fishes and this was a 18 month old or a 15 month old she was just sticking the fishes into the fishbowl and it, you know it occupied a good half hour another thing she's got is a bin full of rice and she dyed the rice different colors and the child sits there and plays with that i mean there's all sorts of things you can do with things you have at home to keep them busy keep them active the hardest is going to be for families that are trying to work and there's a two parent career and then for small children, there's gonna to have to be a give and take. Someone's gotta be on the child and someone's gotta be on, on the work front. Um, most companies I hope are being fairly forgiving of those situations um, and allowing employees to take some time to, to be with their toddler or their infant. Um, but it's routine, 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 routine. Even in our clinic to keep the clinic staff and myself kind of calm, we have a routine. Every morning at 8.30, we do what we call a huddle. And every morning, every afternoon at four o'clock, we have a debrief huddle. 
And that happens every day. And it's just a routine to just keep us in the habit of getting up, getting dressed. You know, there's some pressure if you have to face your colleagues at 8.30. Yeah, absolutely. Not to, to do a, a call on your pajamas in the morning. Yep. <laughs> But you also mentioned for older kids to give them some chores around the house, yes. to reach out to their friends. I think we are so um, consumed now that we need to do homeschool when we don't know how to do homeschool. You know, honest, unless you are a parent who is also a teacher, we are struggling with the technology that to use for our kids in the classroom and how to teach the, the curriculum. Is it okay to relax a little bit and teach kids to do the chores, to do the laundry, to help us cook? Yeah, and I think it helps children for the older kids. It helps them deal with their own worries about this, to feel like they're helping out, they're participating. You know, right now I'm working in the hospital two days a week um, until next week when I go on service. And when I'm away, my daughter's in charge of lunch for the house. And, you know, and she's done it and she loves it. And helping out with laundry, sorting the laundry, starting the laundry. I mean, these are life skills and there's a great chance to learn them. So that's a great way to keep them busy as well. And then I think for the older children, they need their peers. They need to have connection to, to other people. Um, so letting them have FaceTime with their friends, encouraging it, setting up um, Zoom like play dates or um, Zoom exercise dates where the girls all exercise or the kids all exercise together. Like those are great ways to sort of get them engaged with each other playing with each other more and more sports clubs are doing these little groups where they'll do like drills together. Um, you know, it's a great way to sort of set up some, uh, some community. Absolutely. We so much need this community right now. And you even mentioned to try to have a birthday celebration when you're talking uh, offline before. So the kids still have that sense of, you know, some normal, uh, whatever that normal looks like for a family, that if things still go on. Yeah, I think things that one family would celebrate should still be celebrated, regardless of the pandemic. We just have to find a creative way of doing it differently. Yeah, you also, we're also talking about uh, screen time, because I know that there was not a recommendation for parents of preemie babies or any baby that were, or baby or a toddler to be uh, glued to the screen or to video games. And I know there's some different recommendations now during the quarantine. What are we uh, recommending now? What are the alternatives? So, um... It, not so much for babies, but the American Academy and the Society for Developmental Peds have both sent out emails and they haven't made it a policy statement because I think everyone's hoping that this won't last long enough where we need a policy, but they've both sent out emails to all of their members saying, you know, we could probably relax the rules on screen time. Um, if you think about how we're existing for work and for social, it's all through our screens. And so for our kids, we have to sort of give them a little bit of a break and let them have their screen time longer than we would normally tolerate um, to keep everybody just sort of sane. And, you know, we put up on our, um, our site some good websites that were, you know, if you're going to do screen time, some fun things to do, like Google has all these, you can tour streets in Paris, you can uh, go to China and walk around, like there's all these cool opportunities that are, if you're going to do screen time, could be educational ways to do it. So even though you're not necessarily on your school curriculum, your child's still learning. You know, that's another alternative that um, that can be really nice. But I think chilling out on the screen time for now is reasonable. It nice. certainly is. We're telling all of our families and I put up a post saying, relax, it's OK. And I think having that endorsement from the doctors made us feel less guilt about how much screen time our kids have been having those days, because I mean, my house, we've been living on uh, games, TV and, and FaceTime with friends and yep. messenger kids through Facebook now for, for the kids to stay in touch with each other. But obviously if it makes us, especially the moms and dads who are working from home, uh, I think that guilt comes a little bit stronger too for us. Yeah, I mean, and it's, uh, um, I think there's a huge benefit to just relaxing and forgiving ourselves. My God, this is like, no one's seen anything like this in a hundred years. There is no rule for how we're gonna do it right. There isn't. But I think if we try our best and we sort of lighten our restrictions a little bit, I think we'll all come out of it just fine. I thank you for that. But I also want to uh, touch base on the parents' own well-being because we were talking before and you mentioned to me offline that kids do pick up on our stress. And certainly this time is making parents more stressed because not only with what's happening uh, with 
you know, the virus itself, but also, uh, you know, financially is going to affect so many of us, the jobs, and there's so many things on the line that is way beyond just the, I mean, not just, but the virus. So how can we better cope so you can help our children better? Yeah, um, and after we're done, I can send, I couldn't find them before, but I can send some of the stuff that we've written and put out. But um, I think each individual kind of has whatever their recipe is to help them relax. And you may have discovered it when you were in the NICU, you may have known it before you went into the NICU, um, you may have discovered it after, but whatever that is, I would say do it, um, unless it's going to a shopping mall. That's just not gonna happen. Um, but, you know, for example, going for walks, um, uh, continue to do it. You know, even though the parks are closed, there's lots of places to walk. It's watching spring blossom has been amazing this year. I don't know if I'm just more aware of it because I, I walk a little bit more. Um, um, you know, reading. Some families really escape by reading. So public libraries often have ways to get virtual books. So Toronto Public Library has a way you can get all your books virtually. Um, that's a great solution and it's, it's, it's free. Um, it might be Netflix and chill out for a couple hours. That's fine. Uh, yoga, there's tons of Zoom yoga classes, Google classes on yoga, um, exercise. Like, But we have to take care of ourselves. We have to eat, sleep, and have some sort of a schedule in order to support our children. And, and we owe them that. We do owe them that. While we can't control what's going on, we can control how we react to it. And... I think where I take comfort is there's not one person that I can think of that isn't going to be affected by this virus in some way. So while it is frightening to think about the economy and what's going to happen, the flip side of it is we're all in it together and we're all going to have to find a way out together. Um, so, you know, for now, all I can do is keep myself inside and, and play the part of minimizing the fallout from this and hopefully containing how long we have to be contained. Absolutely. So, uh, Dr. Chair, just to end our session, is there any on extra online resource that you recommend uh, that families could just look it up? And we also going to make those resources available on our um, Facebook group and page and also on our website. Is there anything yeah. on the top of your head that you can suggest? I mean, one of the sites that we that I've been following for the last several months and I'm in love with is New York Times Parenting. Um, incredible. They put out something once or twice a week. They're always very insightful, good advice. Um, uh, it might be, you know, parenting. You're at, it's always different ages. It's, it's excellent. I read that religiously. Um, and then we had a bunch of other resources that now I can't remember. There was a children's book on COVID. A lot of these now are more and more, people are more and more aware of them. But I'll send you all of those, um, those posts so you have those to put, to put up as well. And that's wonderful. I also found uh, Holland Blue Review Kids Rehabilitation Hospital has a great page on tips for families living with autism, that it might be a very challenging time uh, just right now for, for kids at home. So yeah. Dr. Paige Church, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and listen to your perspectives and perceptions and thank you for all the work that you've been doing with your families at Sunnybrook and across Canada. We really appreciate all the work that you do for all of us. And if you're home now, uh, stay tuned. On Monday, I'll be talking to Dr. Carol O'Brien, who is a neonatologist and also a lead researcher on family integrated care and how can families engage in the care of their babies during the pandemic in the hospitals. And Wednesday, we have Kate Robson again, 1 p.m. Eastern time, doing a real-time uh, support group for families. So follow us on our social media channels. We are going to keep updating uh, with the latest development on COVID-19 and how is it affecting our NICU families. Thank you so much. And I see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.